Now, last week we started our series called Make New. Everybody say, Make New. And I won't make you repeat after me a whole lot more. And in the, the series big idea, what we're trying to talk about over these next few Wednesday nights is that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible states that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away and all. Everybody say all. All is made new. And so in this series, we are exploring how Jesus makes us new and how we can walk in this newness of life, not just for ourselves, but so that we can reflect his glory to everybody that we come across. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I'll read it from the King James Version, it says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Behold, all things are become new. And we're going to talk about a couple different Bible characters in, in this uh, part of the series tonight. And tonight, we're really going to talk about having, having new purpose. And last week, we talked about Rahab. And I'm going to review that in just a minute, but we're going to talk about having a new purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, a new purpose. Look at that same person again and say, you have a purpose. Now, when we think about this word purpose, there's a lot that can come to mind if we really think about it. And sometimes it can be daunting or maybe hover over our lives as young people because purpose is, is a powerful thing. And so here's a couple questions I want you to consider tonight. What do you think is your purpose in life. What is your purpose in life? And maybe you don't have the answer, and that's okay, because we're all young in this place, and as we live, and as God begins to work on us, we're going to figure out what our purpose is. But at least for some of us, maybe we have an understanding or have a calling in our life or some sense of what we want to do and who we want to be when we get older, when we graduate, after we go to school. What is the purpose that you have in your life. Another question to consider. Does everybody have the same purpose? Why or why not? And can your purpose change over time? But most importantly, I think this is the question that I want you to consider the most, and we're going to talk about it tonight, but how do I find what my purpose is? How do you find what your purpose is in life? Now, when we think about purpose, um, there, are, there are objects, there are things in our world that have a, a designated purpose. I need two volunteers. Anybody want to volunteer themselves? You always volunteer, and I, I'll pick you if nobody else wants to. Does anybody else? What? Yeah, come on up. Do you want to go against Calum? Okay, come on up. Let's give it up for Calum and Gavin. Now, I need you guys to go back to back. And then lock arms. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Now, I've got some, I've got some um, things from my kitchen in my book bag, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give one to Gavin. And Gavin, you need to explain what this item is to Calum by trying to define what its purpose is. Does that make sense? You can explain it by what you would use it for, but you can't say the name of the thing. You follow me? Okay. That was like... That was like such an obliging, yeah. Did you hear that? He's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to do that. I'm going to. There is a, what is the game called? Guess? Man, that's so generic. Uh, I think we call it uh, Guess. Okay, I can't let you see all the items because he might have one of the other ones, okay? And uh, I didn't wash these. We just, we just cooked with them for supper, so there's some mashed potatoes on it. I'm just kidding. Do you know what this is? You can't say. But you just have to nod yes or no, because if you don't know what it is, then it would be really hard to explain it. Do you know it? If you don't, there's no shame in not knowing it. Okay. You need to explain this to Caleb. One, two, three, go. I don't even know the proper name for what we would call this. <laughs> we could. Go ahead. Uh, 
Squirter. Hmm. We're, we're talking kitchen stuff too, by the way, just as a, a, a broad hint for everything. Should, should we pass this one? Call a friend. You would maybe use this on like, can you guys help me? Like, if this is not a good hint, yeah, you you would you would lift juice with it. You would suck up juice with it. You would maybe use it if you were cooking like a a, a turkey. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You can't say the word, Gavin. That's it's a baster. You can't say. Are you serious? Well, then why did we do the object? Okay, we need to redo that. That was that was my fault. Okay. You got this one, right? Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay. It's not a spatula. Yeah, tongs. He got it. Okay. Good job. Okay, let me see this. We're going to switch sides. You have to sp you have to explain that to him. One, two, three, go. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I feel like it has you would define this as two words, right? Two words, we're all on the same page. Yes. Oh, so challenging. Yo, I understand what you're getting at for sure. For sure, for sure. Yeah, you're getting there. Yeah. You got it. Yes, you have to explain it. You said the first word that I would define this with. Is that fair? Yeah, he said egg. That's typically what people would say, right? Egg, 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 no? Oh. It's a great lesson. Should we pass this one? I got, okay. You want to see it? It's, it, it? I was thinking like, yeah, it's like an egg beater. What would you guys call that? Did he look at that? Hopefully he didn't. Well, no, but this is a whisk. Hold on. This is a whisk, right? Why is our whisk so small? <laughs> just get like a little, just like the world's smallest bull. <laughs> okay, ready for this, Gavin? One, two, three, go. You, yeah. Alpha Getty. Alpha Getty. We were talking about Alpha Getty like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Ah, uh, I don't know if you should. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you could use the word open, right? That's kind of like if you're you said open. You can't use you can't use a word that explains it. Okay, I got one more. Don't look, Gavin. I got one more. I feel like this one's really challenging. Where did it go? Hold on. Okay. Do you know what this is? Yeah, I can explain it. Okay, Gavin. I, I didn't think anybody was really going to be able to guess this one. It's hard to explain. I like drinking coffee, okay? And like, uh, you know what I mean by like eggnog lattes? So when you're making an eggnog latte and you, uh, oh, my bad. Uh, when you're making an eggnog latte, you have this uh, liquid. It's a white liquid. And you're wanting to 
um, you're wanting to like heat it up, but also like move it at the same time, okay? Because you want to add that to your coffee. So this this white liquid, and then you you heat it up and and like shake it with this thing, and then pour it into your coffee. Well, I don't know how else to say this. It's a it's powered, okay? It, this is like there's a battery in what I'm holding. Okay, so I hit the button and it shakes violently, the white liquid, and it and I and then when it's done and it's hot and it's shaken up and it's expanded, I pour it into my coffee. Yeah, he got it. Good job. Okay, now just face the screen and just stay there for the rest of the service. I'm just kidding. Let's get up for Gavin. That was probably the hardest one. Yeah. Yeah, the milk frother. So if you just go to the kitchen, and when I'm done, can you just have one ready for me? No, I'm just kidding. I don't know if there's any back there. What a trooper. He said I could do it. Isn't that kind? Gavin is such a nice person. Awesome. That's the baster. And that's everything. So the point is, is that everything has purpose, and not everything shares the same purpose. It will be hard to open your Alpha Getty with a turkey baster, right? It would be impossible. You couldn't do it. I think no matter how hard you hit the can, it wouldn't open using a turkey baster. And I don't think you could baste a turkey. Is it just a baster? I'm just calling it a turkey baster. Turkey baster? It would be, it'd be really hard to, to take that liquid up and pour it all over that turkey using a can opener. It just wouldn't work because they have been designed with different purposes. Everybody say purposes. They've all got different purposes. So in this series, we're discussing how Jesus makes us new and how we can walk in this newness of life to reflect his glory. Like I said in the last lesson, we began by exploring this new life that Jesus wants to give each and every one of us. And the person we talked about was Rahab. Now, Rahab was a person who was really in, in all manner of thinking. She was appointed for destruction because she was in the wrong place, but she just so happened to be in the wrong place, but she was there at the right time. And so because she showed faith by saving the Israelite spies from the king of Jericho, she was offered a new life that she did not deserve. And similarly, we do not deserve to have this new life that is promised to us. There is nothing that we could do. We couldn't live good enough to obtain it because we have been born in sin. That's what David said. We have been born in sin. In my, in my mother's womb, it was, I was conceived and there was sin. And this has been in my life from the very beginning. But Jesus, he gives us this opportunity to be born again if we place our faith in him. And so through faith, we are obedient to him. And because of our obedience, we have to repent of our sins. We've got to be baptized in Jesus' name and seek after the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so today, we're going to continue our discussion by talking about the new purpose we find in our new life with Jesus. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, if you've got your Bible, and we are going to put it on the screen, I believe, behind me. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, I'm going to read from the New Living. It says this, it says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. Seems like a bit of a strange thing to do that these fishermen would be washing their, their nets on the shore of the sea. And Simon Peter, he was one of those fishermen. And it was his way of life, but it was not an easy way of life because when when Simon Peter went fishing it wasn't just a recreational activity that he did during the summertime just to go out and relax no that's not what it was at all it was literally his livelihood and so for him whether he caught anything mattered because he was trying to provide for his family with his purpose and his calling which was to be a fisherman and so some days Peter he may have gone out with his brothers and caught enough fish to call it a day pretty early in the day but then he also had days like this one 
that he was experiencing right here in Luke chapter 5. He had days like this that when he had fished all night long, he didn't catch anything at all. Either way, the reward was the same. The next day, regardless of whether he ended his day early or had to fish all night, his reward for the next day was the same, and that was that he had to go out and do it all over again and again and again, day after day after day. And so it's fitting that in these verses, Peter was washing his nets because really at this moment, he was washed up, so to speak. He was a little bit frustrated with what had just happened the night before. No fish for him meant no money and possibly no food for the day. And so certainly he didn't want to go home empty handed, but he had fished all day and fished all night. And at this point, he really didn't have any choice at all. So when we continue on in Luke chapter 5, verse 3, it says this. It says, Jesus, stepping into one of the boats, he asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. And so he sat in the boat, and Jesus taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we have worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. When Jesus was preaching, he often went to places that it was an open air setting. He didn't have an audio system or anything that he could carry around with him when he was preaching or teaching parables or talking to the crowds. And so he had to go to places where large groups of people could hear him openly. He would go to places where his voice would carry naturally, and that's why we see him preaching on mountaintops or, or places like on the water, because his voice would project so that everybody there could hear what he was saying. And so, with a large crowd gathered, Jesus asked Peter to row him out onto the water so his voice could project across the sea so that everybody there could hear what Jesus was about to say and what Jesus was about to preach. And at this moment, it's pretty fair to say Put yourself in the, the shoes of Peter. This was probably the last thing that he wanted to do was get back into his boat and go out onto the water once more. Really, if it wasn't the last thing he wanted to do, it was probably the second last thing that he wanted to do because at the end of Jesus' sermon, after he decided, you know what, no problem, we'll go out onto the water and you can preach there, Jesus said, hey, Peter, let's go fishing. And so now Jesus is really making a bad day even worse because not only did he probably just want to go home and get some rest to prepare for the next time he had to go fishing, but Jesus has put him out into the water. He said, now that we're here, why don't we go fishing once more? And Jesus, Jesus was a carpenter. Simon Peter was a fisherman. So what would Jesus really know about fishing in the first place? And so Peter said to him, he said, well, we've been doing this all night and, and we haven't caught anything. But if you insist, if you really want us to, if you really think that it's going to be beneficial, we'll push back out into the water and we will go fishing. Verse 6 to 8, it says this, and at this time, their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. The nets began to break, and a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. That's a weird thing, right? Think about that. This is a miracle that is taking place. He's tired. He's burnt out. He's fished all night. They go back out, and the boat's full, and the second boat's full. And Simon Peter says, can you just leave me alone? Not, oh, thank you so much, but he says, oh, Lord, please leave me, for I am such a sinful man. It seems like a bit of a, a weird reaction. But, but Peter, he said, you know what? I'm going to launch out just like Jesus said. And he put his nets down into the water just like Jesus said. And perhaps you can only imagine if you were there that day, if, if we could see that glimpse into time. I'm sure Peter was, was rolling his eyes and begrudgingly just throwing the nets out into the water because, again, this was probably the last thing he wanted to be doing at this moment. But he, he rolls his eyes and throws the net out into the water, let's say. And, and did this carpenter, did Jesus not understand that they had already tried to do this all night? Maybe there's just no fish here right now. Maybe they are out into deeper waters, or maybe we'll have better luck tomorrow or in a few days. Yet when Peter obeyed what Jesus said, the miraculous 
took place. And suddenly, Peter had so many fish in the nets that he needed help hauling them all in. In fact, the text says that his nets began to break from that enormous catch that he had received. And so Peter, he, he falls on his face before Jesus, and he didn't feel worthy. That's why he said, depart from me. Peter said, I'm just a sinner. Depart from me. I, I don't deserve this blessing. I don't deserve what you're doing for me in this moment. So please depart from me, for I am just a sinner. Yet Jesus, when he looked on Simon Peter, he saw more than just a sinner. He saw somebody who was willing to obey even when it didn't make a whole lot of sense. It didn't make any sense for Simon Peter to do what he did, but he obviously knew who Jesus was and knew that Jesus could perform miracles. And he said, you know what? You're asking me to do something that I don't understand, but clearly you have something in mind. So I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do, Jesus. And you could say Peter fell on his face that day, but it would be equally correct to say that Peter fell on his faith. He fell on his face physically, but he fell on his faith spiritually. And because he had placed his faith in Jesus, Jesus called Peter to a new and to a greater purpose. Luke chapter 5 again, verses 9 to 11. It says, For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. And his partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid, for from now on you will be fishing for people. Jesus said some weird things. And we have the the ability to have this hindsight 2020 vision that when Jesus said this to Simon Peter now, from our place, when we read through the Bible and we know what goes on for the rest of the story, we know what Jesus was saying. But, But when Jesus is saying this to Simon Peter, he's saying something pretty strange. Hey, you know what? Don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. You're not going to be fishing for fish anymore, but you're going to be fishing for people. It's like when he talked to Nicodemus, right? You must be born again. And he said, how do I enter again into my mother's womb? He's thinking very literally, and I'm sure Simon Peter in this moment is scratching his head saying, what does Jesus mean when he says, I'm going to be fishing for people? What does that mean? And the next verse says this. This is an important one. Luke chapter 5, verse 11. It says, And as soon as they landed, they left everything. Look at your neighbor and say everything. They left everything and followed Jesus. They left what they had right there on the shore that day. They had boats. They had nets. They had fishing tackle. Whatever was there, they said, You know what? We are just going to leave this here, and we are going to follow after Jesus. Peter, he saw himself as a fisherman, but Jesus saw Peter as a fisher of men. And when Peter walked away from his nets that day, he wasn't walking away from a hobby. Hear me tonight. It wasn't just something that he did recreationally. It wasn't just something that he did on Saturday mornings for fun with some family. That's not what's going on at all. He wasn't walking away from a hobby. He was walking away from his purpose. Everybody say purpose. However, More important than what he was walking away from was what he was walking toward. Because living for Jesus is not just about what we leave behind, but it's about what we begin to pick up in its place. And I'm sure that to be there that day, to see the haul of fish that they brought in so great that their nets and their boats could not contain it, they needed help to bring it in. I'm sure it was a miracle like no other that they had seen up to that point. And I'm sure it was very persuading that they said, this man clearly has power that none of us have. But imagine what what it would have taken for him to say, you know what? I'm going to drop everything that I have. I'm going to drop my intended purpose. I'm going to drop what I think about my life. I'm going to drop what I want to do. I'm going to drop what I've got planned. And I'm going to follow after this man that they call Jesus. And he left everything behind to pursue a greater purpose, and a greater calling. It's hard abandoning the old. It's hard sometimes turning away from what we have and pursuing the greater things that God has in store for us. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22, it says this. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw these two brothers, Simon, also called Peter. We just read this story, but it's in Matthew this time. And Andrew... 
throwing a net into the water for they fish for a living. And Jesus called out to them, come, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and they followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee. Listen to this next part. Repairing their nets. And he called, he called them to come too and they immediately followed him and left their, vo- their boat and their father behind. Now, this is the same story that we just read, but at this time we're, we're reading it in the book of Matthew because uh, but Matthew left out some of the details uh, from Luke's story. Here we find Peter mending his nets on the shore. Why was Peter mending the nets? Because we read in Luke that he caught so many fish that the nets broke. And so when Peter, when he heard that call of Jesus, Peter left the broken nets right where they were and followed Jesus. No nets, so to speak. No nets meant that there was no backup plan. He didn't say, let me take this to my house. He didn't say, let me pull this back. Let me put this into the boat. Let me pull the boat onto shore and and put it back where it was. There was no backup plan. He didn't say, okay, Jesus, uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I'm going to be here and we're going to go on a road trip. I'm going to do whatever you need me to do. That's not what happened. No nets. It meant that there was no backup plan from this time on. No nets meant that there was no way of existing outside of faith in Jesus. And no nets meant returning, no returning to his old purpose. Perhaps you can think of this similar story in the Old Testament. There was this prophet that we know about called Elijah. And he anointed Elisha to be his successor. And as Elisha was plowing in the field with 12 yoke of oxen, Elijah came and he he placed that mantle on Elisha's shoulders. And Elisha, he, he recognized that at this moment, this was the call of God that was being placed on his life. What was going on here was symbolic. It wasn't just about a, a physical cloak or covering, but this was about a, a spiritual mantle that was being placed on Elisha. And so he recognized that in this moment, this was the call of God. This was God calling him to a greater purpose than what he currently had in his life. And so when this happens, he runs to Elijah. He said, can you please wait for a minute before you go? Can you just wait? And then Elisha, he took that that oxen and he slaughtered them. The same ones that he was plowing the field with. He, He took those oxen and he killed them. And then he roasted them on a fire. And he made that fire from the wooden yokes that used to be around the oxen's neck. And then he fed his family for dinner. Elisha, was eliminating his backup plan. It was all or nothing for the call of God in his life. Elisha didn't want anything to fall back on in case anything went wrong with following Elijah. He said, you know what? If this is my calling, if this is my purpose, then we're going to stop right here. We're going to get everything out of the way. We're going to eliminate any backup plans. We're going to kill the oxen. We're going to burn the yokes. We're going to leave the nets, and I'm going to follow after the call of God that he has for me. And if we today are going to live out the purpose that Jesus has for us, we must make sure that we eliminate our backup plans. Because if we are leaving backup plans in our life, if you feel the call of God, if you feel the tugging of God's spirit in a service that you're going to do something great in the kingdom, if you have a backup plan there, really what you're saying is that you don't have faith that God is going to do what he has called you to do. And so he got rid of of his backup plan. And we too must make sure that we eliminate any backup plan when we feel the call of God in our life. We must erase any opportunity to return to our old lives. Because as long as the option is there, we will never fully commit to God's plan for us. As long as the nets are just a few steps away, as long as the oxen are back in the field ready at any moment that I can go back to what I used to do before God called me, we will not fully place our trust. We won't fully commit to what God wants to do in us and what God wants to do through us. And so, after abandoning his old purpose, Peter, he had to learn how to live out this new purpose. And after all, Peter didn't have many details What does a fisher of men even mean? What does it mean to be a fisher of men? We can come back to the music tonight. Peter left his home behind, and he began to follow Jesus. Yes, Peter experienced Jesus' miracles, but he also had to experience Jesus' training. I can't imagine what it would be like. I know it was a great miracle, but for somebody to come to him and say, listen, 
everything that you've been living for, everything that you get up every day to do to provide for your family. I need you to leave it today. I need you to follow me. There was something about this man, Jesus, that even though he may not have ever met him before, there was a calling, there was a purpose, there was an intention that Jesus walked around with that when he came to somebody and said, hey, I've got something greater for you, people said, you know what? If Jesus said it, I'm going to follow him because nothing else matters. And so Peter, he experienced Jesus' miracles. But he also had to experience Jesus' training. Jesus taught Peter how to pray. Jesus taught Peter how to cast out devils. And Jesus showed Peter how to have love and compassion, even towards those who do not deserve it. Jesus taught Peter how to meet the physical needs of others and then appeal to their spiritual needs as well to to make sure they were fed and to make sure they were clothed and make sure they had a place to live but then also he would he would edge towards what they needed spiritually now walking in our god-given purpose not just as a, a group of people not just as a youth group not just as a church family, not just as a a part of a greater community of people in Atlantic Canada, but in our personal life, walking in my God-given purpose, walking in your God-given purpose is more, is about more than just hearing and responding to God's call in our lives. Because there is this preparation process that if we are going to walk in the call of God, we need to follow these steps. Just like Peter, we need to learn how to pray. We need to learn how to operate in the spiritual, how to operate in the supernatural. Just like Jesus did and and just like Jesus showed Peter, we must learn to show love and compassion toward everyone. And everyone means everyone. There's nobody excluded. We are the church. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are called to show love and compassion to those that may, it may be challenging to show them that sometimes to love what some would say are the unlovable, to show compassion towards people that really may not deserve compassion, but we do it anyway. And also, we must learn ways that we can open others up to receiving the gospel. And this preparation process, it involves many things. But the three things that are most important tonight are this. Prayer, studying the scripture, reading the word of God, not just hearing it from a pulpit a couple times a week, but in your personal life, in your walk with God, opening up your Bible and trying to get understanding from it for yourself. And then there's also spiritual leadership. Now, depending on the specific call that we all have on our lives, can I make it clear tonight? There is a call on every life in this room. Look at your neighbor say, there's a call on your life. From the front to the back, say, there's a call on your life. We are all called to minister. We are all called to serve in the kingdom. But depending on that specific call that we have on our personal life, we we may even have to develop some specific talents. It may require us learning how to do graphic design, playing an instrument, singing, public speaking, teaching, preaching, involved in Sunday school and knowing how to work with kids or or younger children. Those are things that that we might have to work on if we have a specific calling in our life. And, And regardless of our specific purpose, the purpose of every single person in this room, from the front to the back, from the youngest to the oldest, regardless of what that calling and purpose is that God has on your life, your your core purpose, what we are all called to do is to share the gospel with everybody that we can. It's that when we go to school, when we go to work, when we're interacting with friends and family that don't know the Lord yet, our call is to live a life and to also teach and preach this gospel. Because one day we will spend eternity somewhere. It will be heaven or it will be hell. And our purpose, our calling, and our duty, and it is our honor, it is to preach the gospel of Jesus to every single person that we meet. And so we must embrace our new purpose 
Because if we can embrace the call that God has for us, if you can embrace the call that God has for you, if you can take hold and, and seek understanding and, and go after God and say, God, whatever you want to do in my life, I'm releasing my life to you. I just want to walk in your will and in your purpose. If you will do that, you will make an eternal difference. Because life is not just about going through motions. Life is not just about going to school for 12, 13, 14 years, and then after that you go get a job so you can pay off some debt, and, and maybe one day you buy a house, you get married, you have kids, and you die. That's just existing. That is not purpose. But God said, among all of those things, among everything that you're going to do in this life, you've got a calling and a purpose that I am birthing in you, that I have placed in your life, and I want you to release it to the world around you. But just like Simon Peter, that means that there has to be something within me. There has to be something within us that says, okay, God, whatever you want to do in me, I'm open to it. And, and if that means that I don't go to the school that I thought I was going to go to, that's okay. And if that means that I'm not going to have the career that I thought I was going to have, that's okay. And if it means that I'm not going to move to that city that I thought I was going to go to one day, that's okay. Because God, what matters to me more than career and anything else in this world is just to make sure that I'm walking in your will and fulfilling the purpose that you have for my life. I want to make sure that every day that I live, that every week, every month, every year, that I am making an eternal difference in the life of somebody around me. I don't want to die one day, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now, however long I live, and they say that was such a nice person, and he was so faithful to God, but I didn't do anything. I didn't have anything or legacy that was left behind. I want to make sure that I am investing in eternal things and not just living life for Alex, but I am living life so that the kingdom of God is growing and expanding and advancing. And more than that, I want to take everybody that I know to heaven with me. And that only comes when I surrender to what I want to do and say, God, have your way in me. God, let me be your hands and feet. God, I want to be your mouthpiece. God, I want to teach Bible studies. God, I want to connect with those people from school. I want to love the unlovable. I want to show compassion on people that are hurting or maybe people that don't deserve it. I want to hang out with that person that doesn't seem like they have any friends. God, I want to make an eternal difference in the world around me. But that only comes by surrendering what our purpose is, what we think our purpose is, and saying, God, not my purpose, not my will, but thy will. God, not my purpose, not my ideas, not my agenda. None of those things matter to me. God, what I care about is living the life that you want me to live and walking in your calling and walking in the ministry that you have for me. Would you stand with me tonight? I want to close this service in prayer. And if you are comfortable with this, I want you to link up with whoever's beside you. Every single person in this room, there is no exclusions. There is no exceptions. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what seat you're sitting in. It doesn't matter what family you came from. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church for, whether this is your first service or you've been here your whole life. You have a calling. And as your youth pastor, as a pastor at this church, I want to see the call of God fulfilled in your life. Because if the call of God is fulfilled in your life, it's going to be fulfilled in this youth group. And if it's fulfilled in this youth group, it's going to be fulfilled in this church. And if it's going to be fulfilled in this church, it will be fulfilled in our city. And so I want you to link up with whoever's next to you. And I want you to pray. And just pray a prayer of surrender. God. Whatever you have in store for my life, whether it's tomorrow or five years from now, God, I, I just say, let your will be done. Would you, would you do that with me? Would you connect with that person and also just lift your voice?